Right, so uh, this one is going to be maybe a little more sentimental um, because it involves content that was some of the richest uh, I was exposed to as a child. Of course, music television has had a really big role in our lives, and I would like to introduce for the next presentation uh, two of the folks that are, are charged with maintaining the vault of this swath of our history. Uh, Jamie De uh, Devenair and Joanna Salazar, please come on up, and we really look forward to this one. And again, I think some of you might find this pretty sentimental, especially these days. Thank you. Wow, that was tough. So since we can't really top that act, we're just going to play a video, and hopefully that entertains you. Welcome to MTV Music Television, the world's first 24-hour stereo video music channel. I want my MTV! Boxers or briefs. I'm really happy for you. I'm let you finish. The one and only Pee Wee Herman. Bruno. You gotta come up in your waist, please don't shoot up the place. Cause I see some ladies tonight that should be having one. Baby, one baby. Anything else? Yeah, get used to this face. Don't A W A Y C. Delete that. I'm Liberace, your guest DJ. I'm Chris Rock. I'm a comedian. Hi, this is Jerry Seinfeld. Don't forget to join me right here on MTV. Here's John and the Ramones. Yeah, we're from Miami. Fans of uh, Marilyn Manson. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds, 30 seconds to redecorate this room. Right here. I couldn't begin to tell you what the world doesn't see in me right now. I'm Beyonce. I'm not a big deal. Say, I just know that. All right. I'm telling you, I'm a big fan. Can you pay my bill? Why are you a Prince fan? Because Prince is bad. Hi, I'm Robert Downey. You're watching the big picture. Make me a Denver omelet. Adam Sandler's my name, and uh, he's a, a, a young boy. He's got I didn't want to be a front man. I just wanted to be back there, but you know, be a rock and roll star at the same time. I'm kind of like a glamorous bag lady. Maybe this music can bring the sides together. We're gonna talk about fashion. Is it fashion? Is it you? Is it now? Is it wow? That's right. It's the sound of the future. We're getting a uh, World Wide Web site set up. Let's surf, shall we? So I'm going to go to some email right about now. Keep those messages coming in. Do you regret saying that you weren't, were not an odd MTV man? A lot of people. We've got some big problems, and you guys are part of the solution. On MTV Music Television, you'll never look at music the same way again. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Johanna Salazar. And uh, I'm Vice President of Production Planning and Operations at Viacom. And as you just saw, this uh, video that we put together was just one of the many pieces that we use to go out and get buy-in to the project so that we can get key stakeholders to support the project and give us money so that we could actually do it. So um, this project started in 2006. It was called uh, the DPI, or Digital Production Initiative. Um, the project initially was um, focusing on enabling digital delivery for production content. 
And really what uh, drove us to, or the main focus around the project was to drive efficiencies in the creative process through digital workflows. So, <clears throat> sorry. One, uh, one of the things that we started noticing was that, you know, notable moments in history were happening, and, and thanks to that, um, some of them were kind of morbid deaths in, um, in the music industry. So those kinds of um, uh, moments in time actually helped us sell this project. So Michael Jackson's death in 2009, Whitney Houston in 2012, Amy Winehouse in 2011. These were just some of the few um, moments in time that actually highlighted the, the value of the vault. And um, in 2012, we launched DPI 2.0. And that really focused on promoting secure and efficient digital workflows for production. So in 2012, there was a shift in uh, TV production technologies, and that facilitated the move away from tape-based um, productions and archiving workflows. And then in uh, 2013, we decided to launch a POC to um, encode 2,500 tapes. And that really was another um, stepping stone in helping us get this project uh, greenlit. And then in 2014, we launched uh, what we call the Vault, or DPI 3.0. And um, this project really is what started um, what we call today, again, the Vault, and helping us uh, archive legacy assets. And um, really going back and helping productions access, uh, or the focus was to help productions access, or have uh, access to content immediately. So the scope of the project um, has been to transform the most valued tape assets of the footage library into a curated digital library. So we started um, by identifying uh, key priority assets. So we identified 400,000. Um, by the end of this year, we're hoping to have digitized 300,000. Um, we also wanted to standardize metadata and treat, um, treat metadata as a corporate asset. And then obviously, providing production um, with access to this, uh, instant access to, um, to the legacy content. So my job is the boring stuff, the business stuff. So Jamie will come back and, and talk about the fun stuff that you guys will probably all want to hear. So when we started the project, we were asking ourselves, well, what are we actually doing and what are the benefits of what we're doing? So obviously we want to turn our physical asset library into a digital library, and we want to identify some uh, potential assets for purge. We, uh, the benefits obviously being monetization, um, digital refresh, so helping um, the productions access um, content that, would, that they can then push out to across digital platforms. And then it creates some efficiencies, which is what the stakeholders always want to hear. Uh, efficiencies in tools, processes, and workflows. So again, on the boring stuff, like why do we even get this project um, uh, greenlit, and what what is the point of getting it greenlit? So we have to identify KPIs or key performance indicators, and we called it the four R's: uh, reuse, reduce, repurpose, and um, identify additional revenue streams. So. One of the things that we actually used as a case study was back in 2014 when we launched the project, we had a team um, who dove deep into the archives and produced a documentary called ARIA by MTV. Um, within this documentary, 95% of the documentary was, all, was produced with uh, archives, archived content, and that actually was a huge stepping stone for us to move the project forward. And um, I'm going to show you guys a clip of it in a little bit. But um, I was told that some of you might be interested in, in the process and like how we actually got this project off the ground, because uh, it's not cheap. And it's a multi-year project. And a lot of companies either don't see the value, they don't think that um, right now is the right time when they have so many other priorities. But what we really did, uh, we started off with 
creating obviously the project charter and educating and engaging as many st uh, key stakeholders into what we were actually doing, getting the buy-in of multiple departments and multiple brands because our company, as you know, is um, many different channels underneath the Viacom umbrella. And the group that we were representing at the time was MTV, VH1, CMT, and Logo. And so we had to get buy-in from, from these groups and brands and make sure that the um, key stakeholders within those brands trusted us with their content. Um, afterwards, we put out an RFP and we spoke with many, many vendors. And um, it, was, it was a tough process on our side because we wanted to just get, get into it and get this stuff done. It took, um, a, you know, it was a long process of, of review and approval and then finally we identified two vendors. When we first started it, we were talking about do we put out an RFP for the whole project so that we can do encoding and metadata all in one? Or do we break it down into phases and, and different levels? And so we decided to break it into the encoding and the metadata part. And then we hired vendors to support those, um, those phases. So we decided to go with Iron Mountain and uh, Crawford on the metadata, Iron Mountain obviously on the encoding. Um, it wasn't... It wasn't a smooth ride at the beginning, I have to be honest with all of you, and it wasn't smooth on either side. And we were both doing this together for the first time, so there were a couple of technical challenges on both sides. And um, then today it's been a smooth operation and it's been a pleasure to work with these guys. So now I'm gonna get into the milestones, what we've actually uh, accomplished to date. One of the big wins for us has been um, breaking down silos and uh, working with and collaborating with multiple internal groups. So when we go out and the, the, like the video that you saw, we produced multiple videos like that one so that we can go to the groups and tell them, hey, this is what we actually have. It's your content. Well, you know, almost like reminding them, getting them excited so that they can go out and use it. And Jamie and, and the team have actually done an amazing job at going out. And I think part of their job is, one, to digitize the vault, and the other is to become salespeople and marketing people. I think they've become masters of multiple skill sets. Um, but these are just some of the examples of groups that we're working with internally. And um, the different content types that we've identified as priority types. And one of the big wins for us has been working closely with uh, the tech teams and helping improve our MAM platform, asset tracking and validation, and ingestion workflows. Now, uh, these are the Viacom teams that we are pretty much our collaborative partners. These are the guys that help us digitize the vault. Without them, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So we had to not only get buy-in from what we call the client, which were the, the folks that I mentioned on the previous slide, these are the guys that we had to get buy-in to, to help us. So another great thing that Jamie did was she was using her charisma and her charming personality. She was able to get a bunch of these folks on board, not only to, to trust that she wasn't there to take their job away from them, that she was there to actually compliment and help them succeed. So that was a huge win for us. Uh, on the, so this uh, slide showcases the skill set of everybody in our team, the, the specific vault team. When we started out, we had um, around 15 people, including Jamie, who was leading the project. And one of the things that we identified as a huge priority as we hired these folks were, you know, they need to be super fans. They need to really understand this content. They need to know pop culture, pop music. Uh, they need to have so many different skill sets and then uh, key um, items that we were actually looking for, obviously, data analysis, media studies, backgrounds in library science, and then other uh, skill sets that came in as more as a, as a awesome benefit to us, like they were musicians, they could edit, they had actually worked in production or post-production previously. Some of them even had rights management and media licensing um, skill sets, so that was great. And 
here, I'm going to share the uh, REM video with you guys and then turn it over to Jamie. But before, I just want to remind you or tell you a little bit more about the REM project. So it was, like I said, 95% of the archive footage was uh, pretty much the whole documentary, uh, 1,200 plus tapes. And um, when we started this project, we were, it was, it was almost taken as a, not, not as a big priority for the company, and the connection wasn't made yet that this could really benefit uh, the Vault project. So that's one of the things that Jamie and I really helped highlight within the company and also brought a lot of recognition to groups within the company that work really, really hard every day on digitizing and taking care of our archives and just our content in general. And I think for the first time, a lot of these folks were able to, to be given recognition for the work that they've been doing for so many years. And so this, uh, this is a trailer for the REM by MTV. And to me, one of the most surprising moments in the trailer is when I had no idea that REM had been on Nickelodeon. I don't know how many years ago, and that to me was really cool. So here's REM by MTV. Introduce the members of the band. This is Mike Mills, he's the bass player. Uh -huh. Bill Berry, the drummer. Bill. Michael Stipe, the singer. Michael. And me, Peter Buck. That's great, it starts with an earthquake. It was a typical Athens story. Four guys meet at a party and want to play other parties and drink beer and have fun. We lived in an old abandoned church, and we threw a party for someone, a birthday party. 700 people showed up. And three of the people that showed up were booking agents from clubs. And all of them were just like, you guys want a job? And we're like, you're kidding. We're banned. What's a frequency can? We did go out and play everywhere and anywhere that we could. We just wanted to get in a van and see the U.S. like Jack Kerouac did. It was really innocent. It was really exciting. All of a sudden, we were writing songs that, that actually we really were proud of. It was named the record of the year over Michael Jackson's thriller. Like, what on earth? Ladies and gentlemen, we don't strive to be a critics man. We don't strive to be a band, hardly. We have our own trajectory. What is the kind of stuff that you guys are listening to? The Breeders, the Pixies, R.E.M. That's me in the corner. Each one of us had their own personal things going on. Being on the cover of Rolling Stone wasn't like the pinnacle of my career. It was really insane. REM drummer Bill Berry is in a hospital after suffering a ruptured brain aneurysm. I'm not going to go leave Bill in a hospital dying. That's not the way this band works. Is it still exciting for you? Do you still, or do you get on stage and think, you know, everybody hurts? Right. So. <laughs> you know, do you still, do you have the, 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 the joy still? I have the joy. We just got together for fun. Things that we never thought would happen have happened. We're just like four guys or whatever, whatever, <laughs> whatever we are. They're my best friends. We worked really hard. We had a lot of luck. It turned out good. In fact, great. <laughs> Um, the slide before was about the team, and I have to point out that one of the best moves we made was hiring Liza Raphael, who is sitting in the audience today. She was the associate producer uh, on that film, and she led the research efforts, so she really had the experience of digging through the data associated with tapes, really understanding what it took to extract the value from the tape archive. So thank you, Liza, it's definitely, and you'll hear a little bit more about Liza because her uh, position has evolved. Her talent has just grown, and so big thanks. As well as Sarah Nix sitting next to her who was uh, helping the library getting those tapes to the production folks, so I have to, have to say that. So um, my name is Jamie DeVenier, Senior Project Manager, and I, one other thing I have to say is that I wouldn't have landed this gig if I wasn't a MIA member. If I didn't have the experience of going to the sessions, all the MIA conferences, and really understanding what everybody does, it was, it's been so invaluable. So I have to give also a shout out to 
all of us in EMEA. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's true. All right, so let's talk a little bit. Let's, let's show some numbers. Um, we have, uh, I, I want to use the laser, so here we go. Yay. Um, we have researched, which means we have selected 265,000 records uh, uh, for encoding uh, with Iron Mountain. We always want to stay ahead of our ordering so our research team can have enough time to dig in and make the right selections because they're really looking at the data that comes in from the production groups. Um, they're looking at the uh, title of the tape assets, content notes, sometimes keywords when the library is ad lotting or cataloging the tapes. They're using all available data. And they're basically, uh, the beginning of this is really um, based on artists and shows that uh, the business is telling us is of value. And I'll get a little bit more into the research methodology in a second. So um, to date, we've ordered uh, around 230,000 tapes from Iron Mountain, yay. Uh, we are running at a, we've, we've run between 1,000 to 1,600 tapes a week. So it's 1,600 orders to Iron Mountain and 1,600 files back close to that. It's a in and out, and we're receiving assets on drives. And I'll talk a little bit more about that workflow. And we have, oh, well, you can see that. We've ingested 220,000. So you can kind of see the trail here, kind of going backwards. So, you know, it's always in process. There's something always in process in these workflows. Um, at the beginning, actually, I think Johanna mentioned it, we had a goal of 400,000 tapes out of uh, 1.5 to 2 million assets. As we were um, funneling through the data, interpreting the data, we found a lot of duplicates. So the 400,000 comes down, and that's where you're getting your 62,000 assets for purge, which reduce costs, and that's a good thing. Um, and now we also have uh, logging. So we, we couldn't quite log right out of the gate uh, in mass logging at, at the beginning. You kind of have to know what you have before you start setting your rules for logging. You really understand where's the value as the assets are coming back. And we did a few POCs at the beginning of this. We did the 2500 on the DPI 2.0. We did another, uh, we did two more actually. We did a 10,000. Uh, POC and then a 30,000 POC. Sarah Nix, I think you selected the 10,000 all by yourself in like two hours or something like that. Uh, <laughs> but it, you know, it was really to set up the workflows, understand what we needed to um, develop for ingestion and you know, really push the, the pedals on our database. <laughs> and, we really, and I'll talk, again, I keep talking more in the future, but you'll see. And uh, so we are encoding that we, we're about 65% of the project are camera masters, raw footage. Uh, we are encoding to ProRes LT. Now, when I came in, I, you know, I, it was a little bit like Switzerland. Like, okay, I had all these great, talented people internally at Viacom. I'm like, what are the tech specs? Should we go to HQ? Well, you know, 90% of our project is standard death. And, Remember, it's for reuse and repurposing. So LT is just fine, and it's been okay. Haven't heard anything, knocking all the wood in the room. Um, but it's, it's fine for what we're doing. Every business has their own needs, their own goals, and all these formats will vary per, per company. So at this point, we're around 2.5 petabytes of storage, which is great. And again, general workflow. So. EC uh, stands for editorial committee, a steering committee. So when I started, uh, you had some folks at MTV VH1 who really produced a lot of these shows from the archive. So it was kind of, let me know where the value is. Where's the shows? W help us understand where we should start. Uh, you know, no brainers here, unplug, storytellers, the craft music shows. And then the, the huge artists of the 80s, 90s, 2000s, the big sellers, the, the ones most uh, closely affiliated with the brand of MTV. And then as we've been getting into this, um, we've become our own editorial committee because the group that we have are really knowledgeable about the history of these channels and they do a lot of research themselves, reading books, doing online research, talking to our groups too. I mean, we still get feedback every time we, you know, work with another 
uh, department and other lead, it informs us and helps us, you know, set the priorities straight. Okay, so here we go. Uh, here, yay. All right, so we're running at uh, 36 minutes per asset. Uh, we do XML ingest, uh, bulk ingest, and logging, uh, because we're not logging every frame, we're logging the most important content per asset. And we define rules around that. And how did we know? Well, we talked to the super users of the content. What is most important to you? We had to start there. That's generally a good place to start with the people who use the content. Um, and we're averaging around seven clips per asset. And then there's curation asset uh, uh, process. Sorry, not asset. Asset. I'll say asset. Every time I say asset, do a shot. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> there's curation part of this. So now you have it. You've logged it. Now you have to kind of let the business know what you have, and that's curation, saying, oh my god, we just discovered this. I've never seen this before. Oh, hey, you were looking for this? Well, we have more of that kind of content over here. And that's been really valuable. And Liza, again, leads a team um, who's really in there curating post-logging, post-receipt of digital assets. And then the ultimate goal, reuse, repurpose. So when we started, um, our database called Alias was not set up for a bulk ingest project. Just one example. If the first day if you were to start and you assigned a researcher Madonna, you assigned, assigned the other researcher the Video Music Awards, chances are they were gonna start taking the same tapes and ordering them and Iron Mountain would have been like, what are you doing? You just ordered that. So we had to put statuses onto the assets and really track it through the whole workflows because these are live assets. The library production groups can call these in at any time and we really need to inform the business. That was step number one, working with our internal uh, tech team. Um, also, batch, we had to get an XML put together, test it with Iron Mountain to do bulk ingest. Uh, asset validation, understanding that we're getting what we receive, uh, looking at a technical level, the files, and if anything's off, it's flagged, and we, we troubleshoot the errors. And then we digital delivery. Well, there was some thoughts of like, you're gonna have this, all these files coming in digitally. And I'm like, these are 1,600 files a week. Costly, kind of complicated. Uh, I mean, you could build a pipe like that, but it, you know, drives, drives work for us. Um, it's easier for us to reconcile, hey, we can do this, but we did set up digital delivery because these were live assets, and when a, uh, someone was in the news, we needed to pull these uh, tapes pretty quickly because as I came in too, the library was migrating, moving their physical uh, assets over to Iron Mountain. They used to be stored um, internally, a few Viacom locations, but now that they were going externally, we needed to get those fast. And so, happy to say we built digital delivery. The library uses it every day, so that's a big win for us. API integration, having our database, you know, doing um, pulling metadata from Crawford on API calls. Also, that as, um, asset tracking is, is based on API. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit more about data analytics. And then uh, we need to clean up metadata when we get it. So we needed to have a bulk update uh, solution on the back end where our content manager who's in charge of cleaning up the metadata can just, you know, hey, I got 12, oops, sorry, 12 uh, Jennifer Lopez spelled incorrectly. I want to correct it right away because any of the con uh, metadata we're getting in, we want it to be good coming into the database. Um, and so I'm just gonna keep going here and standardizing that through the rules and, and in the writing. Okay, so research. Uh, again, started out as artist show. And really understand when a researcher was assign is assigned a subject, or uh, they do research before they even go into alias to understand what's the roadmap of their history at MTV so they know what to look out for, and also to understand, you know, where, where, where is the value of this artist and show? So that's really important. These categories, you know, kind of fall under it, help us also build out our metadata categories. One point here that we've just started doing, which I find really fascinating, um, we've been doing this for three years, and we've gotten this through quite, uh, I'll show you the numbers on the, what we've completed, 
But Leroy Kang now is our head of research, and he put together a really cool process of topic-based research, which is the social, political, cultural topics that are in the library. Yes, we have artists doing what they do, but we also have some pretty heady stuff. Um, based, you know, uh, let me take like uh, censorship. Um, you know, MTV News was really. Uh, ahead of the time researching or, or covering AIDS and HIV, um, gay liberation. I mean, there's some really interesting stuff. We have an asset, uh, there was the Virginia Tech tragedy, the, recently the 10 year anniversary. Sway Calloway went down the, the day after and was, were interviewing the students. And, you know, all the networks were there, but MTV News and its impact on youth culture, they had a whole different conversation with these students. And it was really profound and very important to the history of our time. So I just really, there's truth in these archives. And, and so we, when we're doing the topic-based research, or they're doing it, I can't take credit for it, but um, they're building out vocabularies of terms. So let's take technology, modem, uh, what do you call it? I, I had it all in my CD-ROM, World Wide Web, um, it, you know, Palm Pilot, Beeper, um, all those terms, and they're building vocabulary so they can go in and pull more unique content out. And it's been really cool to see these data sets build to the topics. Censorship's huge, obviously, music, entertainment. Um, we even did sex, that's always an interesting one. Um, and we're gonna use those in the future to build out our taxonomy. So it's been a really cool data exercise up front. So here we are, these are the numbers. 690 artists, 280 shows. And you know, we're getting to, we're getting to a point where like, we're looking at those artists like, mm, is anyone gonna reuse this? You know, we really have to look closer now because we're paring it down. And that topic-based research, you know, reveals more, in, you know, important content sometimes than a, like, B-level artist. Or no insult to an artist that you like, but I'm just saying we have to be cognizant that are these guys, are these assets going to be reused and repurposed? Okay, so let's talk about encoding a little bit with Iron Mountain. Um, there was an article uh, in the fall in Bloomberg. Uh, and there's our fearless leader, Jeff Jacobs, who was really the person who got this project recognized with uh, Johanna, really got the business to say, okay, he was in the editing booth when Whitney Houston passed away. And, and Whitney Houston, there is a story here, and I was trying to show in videos, but Whitney Houston died on a Saturday, I believe. The library, you know, they all came in, they were working really hard pulling these tapes. It wasn't like no one was being responsive, but it was still majority on tape. And so he's in there and he's seen that and we have to go to Yeti and AP to get their own content, Whitney on the red carpet, the VMA. So that's the big story. And so Jeff really kind of was able to start telling that story. Um, and so we do a QC process. Um, Iron Mountain does their QC, I think they use Aurora, and I'm probably getting, the, I always get the name wrong, sorry about that. Um, but they, they do their QC, and because this, this isn't for broadcast, so 3.5 point check is fine. And when the files come in, we have 14 people who also get about 120, 130 files a week, and they do a visual QC. That also allows us to prioritize content, to look at the topics and say, okay, this should go to logging. This, this is where it needs to go. And this we'll put over here, it's not as a priority. So it really helps us to have uh, our eyes on the content. And so we work closely with Iron Mountain. We're troubleshooting all the time. Uh, right now, we're, we just finished testing uh, D, uh, DVC Pro anamorphic tapes and really took it through because our internal DES, that, who help, also helps us out on this, they were like, they couldn't handle that, they didn't have the hardware, so Iron Mountain really pitched in and worked with us, and the files look awesome. Thank you, Iron Mountain. Um, okay, so, and yes, it's always, we have an amazing person, Megan Bess, who is really in charge of receiving the drives, going through, troubleshooting, and also keeping track of billing for us, our monthly billing is very important. And then we have our other vendor, Crawford Media Services. So 
we started logging. We had to, you know, I don't know if you know about Crawford's, let me tell you a little bit. It's a distributed workforce model. We had nine people at the beginning using our own logging tool, and it was a bear. We were getting through about 10 videos a day. All right, just saying, look at the numbers we had. <laughs> so the distributed workforce model allows higher volume of logging to be done, and it's people at home uh, being trained by Crawford and us, and logging constantly. And right now we're doing about 1,000 assets a week, that is about 7,000 points of data. And we, we are not doing clips with Crawford, we're doing markers. It's because our users said, you know what, we're gonna make our own clips. We just need to know where on the timeline that, where the scene starts. So it's been, it's been working really well. Uh, and, and just to show you the difference, the distributed workforce, internally, we did, we, what I say, we did about 80,000 assets Internally, we've done about 15,000. The rest has been made up f through Crawford, uh, coming from the Crawford workforce, so really good. We created a test, which was fun, a trivia test to, to make sure that the loggers uh, that Crawford were onboarding could identify, identify artists from the past. That was really, the artists are so important to our archive, and some of these guys are a little obscure and may not be so easy to find on the internet. And, and it's really, you know, having that test before they have access to our content has really helped. Um, and again, we do a QC pass. Uh, once the uh, logger is finished, there's one QC pass gets pushed back to us, and we, our team does a spot check QC on that writing. Again, API, and also uh, build and maintain taxonomy and categories and keywords, which has been really great. So we have, at this point, over 500,000 uh, points. Did I say that? I'm just so proud of it. It's like a lot of content, so, okay. So this is another part of the story. Uh, yes, it has to do with artists dying before they should. <laughs> no, not that anybody should die, but um, too young is what I want to say. So uh, David Bowie, uh, you know, passes away, and we did digitize over 750 tapes of David Bowie, and we tagged majority of David Bowie assets. This was a middle ground of, of the solution working. It was a combination of our team grabbing those clips as well as the library jumping in and making sure all the groups needing, had access to these clips. So David Bowie died. Within like four hours, they posted a video, and I'm on MTV cut a video that, I'm gonna go back to that for a second, uh, but cut a video of David Bowie challenging MTV in 1983 on the lack of racial diversity on the channel. And back uh, in the 90s, there was a, th a, look, a throwback episode or a retro episode looking back at the 80s, and they only ran like 30 seconds of the conversation. When he died, MTV News cut the whole conversation. So, you know, again, truth in the archives, it was really, I felt bad for Mark Goodman. He was like, whoa, I can't speak for all of MTV, but he was kind of put on the spot. But it showed David Bowie's brilliance that he, you know, pushed the needle and, you know, a lot happened after that interview. And we also had good exposure, you know, it was on New York Times. It was, it was and five million is pretty good uh, for MTV News on Facebook, for sure. So that was a really, a, a, Success. So I just want to go back a second. Sorry, I jumped ahead. Um, here, the fields, the descriptive fields in blue, were pre existing in alias. These were the ones we added to our schema. And when Crawford and our turtle teams log, uh, some are required and some are optional, depending upon what you have available. And, and there is some research required to do, to fill in some of these fields, but we did develop a schema within the uh, database. All right. All right, I'm gonna give it back to Johanna, but there's more video coming, so hold on. 
So the reason why I'm talking about metadata is because, um, as you all know, the workflows associated with producing content are more intricate than ever before uh, in producing, managing, and distributing content, and it, none of that is a simple, uh, simple feat. And metadata now impacts all of those tasks and everyone in a media organization, and Viacom is no exception. So Crawford actually challenged us at one point. They came back and they were asking us why we were writing our descriptions the way we were writing them and why we were doing things the way we were doing them. And so we came back internally and we went back to all the teams that we had uh, worked with originally internally to create what we, our schemas and, and the process that we would be carrying out moving forward. But um, the good thing about it was that when they challenged us, it got us internally to have the conversation again, to bring these teams together and to really identify what are our goals moving forward. So we decided that we were gonna have a, um, we were gonna launch, Jamie and I decided to launch a, a, an internal informal metadata task force to have these conversations. And the reason why we wanted to do this was because metadata matters and metadata is directly attached to monetization and, Somebody like me cares about this stuff a lot. So I decided to dive deep into this and really uh, drive the metadata movement internally. So then we, uh, another project that we had going on, because my, my role has always lived primarily within the production space. So um, I think, you know, creatively, so if we're gonna pitch a project, we're gonna uh, develop a sizzle reel and we're gonna get stakeholders and all this stuff. So I decided to take some of those um, concepts and integrate them into this movement of how do we get metadata to matter at Viacom. And so we hired somebody I call a metadata guru, Sally Hubbard, who's in the room. And um, Jamie really was the one that brought me into this space and introduced me to all you wonderful people, and then we had the conversation internally. The, the production, uh, we had a production project happening and we called it the art of the possible. And within this project, we brought in some consultants and helped identify over 100 pain points that we were having in, within production. And um, metadata was obviously one of them. And so that's when we decided to roll this uh, unofficial or informal task force that we had built and roll it under this um, Art of the Possible project. And so we created the metadata task force as a formal project, uh, assigned project leaders. Uh, we have a couple of the leaders in the room, Lauren Dorr, who was one of the uh, team leaders. Sarah Nix is currently one of the leaders. Jamie Devenier is a leader, and Sally Hubbard is a leader. So these are the ladies that are driving metadata centralization within Viacom. So the first thing that we did was we started talking about what is metadata. The funny thing is everybody in the room had a different answer to what metadata is, so I love that part. Um, but we started really drilling down to why it matters to Viacom. And then what we decided to do afterwards was really help identify, well, how does this help Viacom? It always has to be towards the brand and how this really helps the brand. That's what the business is going to focus on. And then I think the most important part out of this whole thing is you know, figuring out how to do it right. So launching a metadata task force doesn't mean that we're going to do it right. Bringing the right people in place doesn't necessarily mean we're going to do it right, but it's about bringing all those ingredients together, hiring the right people, bringing the right stakeholders, identifying um, what it is that you're looking to accomplish. And then what happened was the task force became almost like the... Um, kind of like the editorial committee um, when we launched the vault. The, now this is the group that we, it's like the town hall. We bring the ideas to the group. The group together comes up with, um, you know, what are the priorities for the company? It started out with a small group of people from one group, and now we have the whole company represented in this task force. So that's been extremely, extremely helpful. The metadata task force, again, was launched to drive a larger conversation around smart data, search, and standardization of assets across brands, utilizing right systems and taxonomies across groups. And the reason why I put this diagram here is because we can sit here and map out systems and talk about taxonomies and schemas and all of that fun stuff all day long. But really, if you don't have a um, 
if you don't have the right values or the right core values within the group, I feel like that's where things just don't happen. So instilling a really um, solid team values, uh, I think it's extremely important to, to the success of any, uh, any project. So because we are Viacom and we're a creative first company, be creative is one of the first uh, values for us, but not just be creative as in like come up with a script and a storyline and none of that stuff. It's, it's more about thinking overall, if we're a group of people talking about metadata, how do we step outside of our own box and, and think differently? One of the first things that I noticed happen in one of the first meetings of the task force was we were in there talking about challenging things and one of the people that was responsible for that one specific challenge was the most resistant. And that's when we, as a group, you know, we sit there and we say, well, this, that's why this is the, called the art of the possible, because it, if we're talking about it, it's impossible, but we need to break it down and make it possible. So by learning and sharing, problem solving, going in and being really present and engaged, and these are the values that we really incorporate for everybody in the group to have um, as we're tackling these problems, because that's what they are. They're all problems, so we gotta really come into the group with an open mind thinking, we're gonna come up with solutions. Um, we also put together a new charter, a new project charter, and we're looking to get buy-in from the company to launch an official metadata management team, and this team will be working across all the business units with all the brands, and this group is primarily focused on being what I like to call like the, the silo breaker. So when we talk internally about where should this, uh, live or maybe it should live within one group that already exists or within another one. I think one of the biggest priorities, um, especially working in a large corporation like Viacom, is if we don't work together, it's not gonna happen. And if I go in saying that this is my project and I own this and my team and my group owns this, that's how you know it's gonna fail. But if you go and you seek out the right people and the people that actually touch, in this case, metadata, and you bring all those people together, and you create a hub, and you create a, a leadership task force um, with the right people who actually are decision makers, that's how you know you're, gonna, you're actually gonna go in, 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 the, in the right direction. So that's the metadata stuff. Now, another really cool thing, and this is where Eliza also comes in, if anybody ha tries to hire Eliza after this, you're in trouble. <laughs> You're dead. <laughs> um, so after getting all of these wonderful, um, you know, doing all the work that we're doing and gathering all the data in Excel grids, the Jamie and Liza and team, they came to me and they were like, well, you know, we have all this stuff on, on an Excel grid, but we're getting all these requests from the business for cur more curation projects. So we... Re Ever, from the beginning, the way the group, um, the team looked compared to today, it's completely different. Uh, we've evolved with time, within time, and, and also to address the needs of the business. And what we did was, well, we have all, these, all this data in Excel grids, why don't we build a tool? This usually in a different company would be something that another department would do, but in this case, because Jamie's a disruptor, we just did it. Um, and because I'm pretty cool, I said, okay. And I usually find the money if it's a priority. So this is what the Vault an Analytics site looks like. And um, if anybody wants a demo, go to Jamie. And um, this is uh, Jamie or Eliza. Um, no, if they go to Eliza, they're gonna try to hire her. Um, so this is what it looks like in, in, on the back end. And um, where, so if I go to Liza and I say, Liza, I need to know everything about Beyonce, I can go into any of the other tools that we already have internally, but in here, we're making it easier. So Liza comes from production, and she says that she wishes she would have had something like this when she was working on the REM documentary. So pretty much, we created a tool that we really needed, and we know that other production teams really needed or need today. So when we told the team that this was coming out, it was like, kids going into a candy store, they were so excited. So that said, do you wanna say anything else? Thank you guys.
we got three short videos. But I, I have to say, Dr. Henley, we had a Michelangelo moment. When Prince died, MTV Classic mistakenly ran Fresh Prince of Bel Air. So we have to show our foibles a little, but we learned a lot from that. So we, we, we can just say what goes wrong once in a while, right? All right, so this first video, end of the story arc, George Michael uh, passes away on Christmas. Uh, teams were able to access this with no help on curation, though the digital libraries still need to be at alert to, for fulfillment. So a very short clip of an interview with George. There were stories that, that hit the tabloids that I made no effort to rebut. My presentation of myself, the lyrics, the dedications, everything that was there in their consciousness other than me sitting with someone going, I'm gay. Yes, I am gay. So of course it was fantastic for the tabloids getting me with my, literally with my pants down. If anything, it just improved things. It improved my relationship with my audience because I became more generous in the way I spoke. Okay, and this next clip, um, two more clips. Uh, it's more about access, and this is an Aretha Franklin, uh, Muck in America short clip. More about, you know, you get a sense of what MTV was doing back then, so hope you enjoy it. I like it because it's sweet, so. We're here. R-E-F-E-C-T. R-E-F-E-C-T. Hi, Aretha. Nice to meet you. These are for you. And thank you. Good night. Can we come in? I can't believe this, Joe. We are uh, actually in her house, and we're filthy dirty, and she, if she lets us stay more than an hour, she's the most gracious woman I've ever met in my life. What are we having tonight? Mm -hmm. What are we going to have? We're going to have chicken Italian and peach cobbler and what's commonly known as rice pilaf. We know what rice pilaf is, but we haven't had any on the road because we've been staying at the Holiday Inn. <laughs> This may be the best. I just opened a can of tomato sauce. Yeah. That's great. We, this may be, no, this will undoubtedly be the best meal uh, we've had on the road since we've been on the road for five. We've been on the road for five days. Serious. This is, this is going to be like how many courses in? Was three or four? Or was it ten? I can't remember. What are we checking out here? Uh, chicken Italiano. Peach cobbler. That's the peach cobbler. I can tell that. Okay, no, I won't do that. You should have a little sneeze tray right here, you know. Let me help you with this. Okay, my pleasure. And this is this is Aretha Franklin's trash. This is too much. And I'm dying. And I opened it up. <laughs> Ma, I opened up the trash can. <laughs> That kitchen would not be on cribs. <laughs> but it's just, you know, it really was, there was a trust in that. And so this uh, last clip, uh, Mr. Axel Rose uh, bearing a nipple. Um, <laughs> um, one of the, the uh, key moments that uh, production groups are looking for when artists are talking about other artists. So that's not usually in the content notes or in the tape title, that comes with logging. And so, this was an unexpected little moment of Axl Rose talking about, well, I won't tell you. It's funny, when it, it's, I wouldn't normally picture you as an Elton, Elton John like launching your consciousness of music. Elton John is it. If, if like, you know, his, especially the first seven albums, Bernie Taupin to me is the best lyric writer that's ever lived on the face of the earth. And, and Elton John was just amazing in the studio and the recording of everything. And it's, some of it's so art. I mean, to me, that's my classical music because some of his stuff is classical. You know, the, and it's, I listen to Elton John all the time. I'm always supposed to meet them. I think they're the only two people I'm like nervous to meet. You know, it's like something always comes up where I don't feel well and I just can't meet them. Sweet. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. Hello. Oh, right. We're going to just do a couple quick Q&A questions. I'm sure this was stimulating. Joanna, what are you doing for rights? How are you matching up rights with? Uh, the we question. digitize everything and prepare everything for production. So it's to, uh, as of today, it's been on a case-by-case. 
Um, this, that's like the million dollar question. We are constantly looking at ways in which we can create maybe collections that are completely rights free or we're looking at the tree, you know, rights free or uh, no rights to, you know, we haven't been able to create that. It's, it's not, it's something that is extremely challenging for the folks that actually handle that. And um, so that's why I kept saying at the beginning, like you, everybody has to work together. If anything, that that was one of the 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 folks in the room when I was talking earlier about the challenge that they were the most resistant. Um, there was a group within that space that you know they were they were the ones that were saying, "Well, that's never going to happen." But when we get in and we break it down, we're able to find that you know solutions. But it's, it's a case by case right now. All righty. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, just to repeat that for the recording's mm -hmm. sake, is that Viacom has a lot of you know, legal resources that they can use to apply to that challenge uh, you know, on an as needed mm -hmm. basis. Right here, and microphone. Please. Wait, and we are we are looking. I know that um, some of the teams that are responsible for that are looking at deals that I can't really talk about that they're currently working on, so that they can create collections of content that it's um, rights free or within uh, a tool that people can access it in an easier way. Uh, Bob Mister Ernie from Iron Mountain, and it is Aurora, by the way, Jerry. Oh, all right, let's do, uh, Ryan, how about you? Thank you, uh, Ryan Servant, I'm the VP of Business Development for Squarebox Systems, also uh, we make the product CatDB. I wanna say like in terms of someone who has to talk to customers like yourselves, but early on in the stage, it's refreshing to see how much work you've taken internally in terms of organization and metadata understanding that a single product isn't gonna come in and day one fix everything. So I appreciate how much work in the 10 years you've, you've done. And I think to that, I, I have a, a two part question. The first one, you don't need to get into the minutia. Keep it quick, Ryan, we're behind. I'm, I'm going fast, don't worry. <laughs> um, is if you had to do something over again in terms of the bigger scope, is there anything you, that you would have done differently? And that being said, what are some of the, I like how you say challenges and not problems. What are some of the bigger challenging your face, challenges you're facing today um, that you didn't foresee happening or you're looking to solve today? That was a good question, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nick. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to do it? Was that more related to business or workflow process? Um, I'd say more workflow, metadata, asset management side, because that's what I do, and I'm, I'm a spoiled mm -hmm. brat. So huh. I, hmm. Hmm. I wish I got a little further ahead on what we call complex assets or composite assets, which is born digital content that is stored on the drives, cards, and local SANs. It is a uh, complex solution uh, that is definitely evolving. Um, I wish it was a little more ahead of that, quite frankly, um, and had a little more knowledge behind it. Uh, because there is a drop in the archive, it does, this raw footage is, you know, it, Miley Cyrus goes like this, Taylor Swift goes like this, and then they come back. So that, that's something, for me personally, wish I got a little bit of an edge on it. Uh, what was the second? Sorry, I'm just thinking complex assets and my head just exploded. It's, it's so. okay. The, the other <laughs> one, well, I mean, so what kind of issues are you facing today or challenges are you facing today that you're trying to solve in terms of managing the assets and metadata and sharing that content? Catching up on metadata, ca catching up on the, the assets. You can see the numbers were at 230,000, we're 80,000 log. It's a time, you know, it's a time of based process and it's and it's difficult, but you know, who knows what the future of AI is gonna do for these assets. Well I Maybe hope that we'll we learn can later have today. that. Uh, but it it is a you know, you sometimes feel like you're slogging through it because you can't get caught up fast enough.